welcome uh, staff and commissioners. I'll call to order the Planning Commission meeting of March 16th. We have the roll call, please. Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Gordon? Here. Maxwell? Here. Wilhelmus? Here. Kennedy? Here. Are there any statements of disqualification tonight? I don't expect on this one. And uh, oral communications? Claire, do you want to say anything? Not on the agenda? Um, good, then we have uh, the consent agenda. Would any commissioner like to pull an item off the consent agenda for more discussion? I would like to pull the approval of the minutes of March 2nd. Okay. That's good. Do we need to vote on that or we just pull it? You can vote on the consent agenda now that does not include that item. Sounds good. So we'll vote on items one and two. I'm happy to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with one and two. Thank you. And I'll second that. And a second from Sean. We have the vote. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Wilhelmus? Aye. Aye. Right. So for item three. Uh, yeah, I, I would like. Oh, it, it looks. I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, I uh, want to apologize. I think the way I made a point wasn't as clear as it could have been, and I was expecting a point to be in the minutes. Um, and I am hoping that we could um, ask for an addendum to the minutes of March 2nd, and it would include the following and I'm happy to tinker with the language, but this is my intent. Um, because additional height along the riverfront is discretionary, proposed projects um, will develop their base density without the discretionary extra height. Projects will include an analysis of the base density and the base density plus the discretionary extra height. The density bonus calculation will then be analyzed in regards to both as a part of the proposal. So that sounds uh, right to me. Can we get a motion in a second to adopt the minutes with that addition? I'm happy to move um, Julie's, uh, Commissioner Conway's addition. Thank you, Commissioner Dawson. Second? I'll second. Seeing the second, uh, we'll have a roll call vote on that. And Ed Tess, you're able to get all that down. I have it on the recording. Okay, fantastic. Or rate them. I have it written down. <laughs> Share notes. Um, Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Maxwell? Abstain. Paul Hamas? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. All right, with that business out of the way. I think Commissioner Maxwell also, had you also requested? No, no. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, so getting that business out of the way, I'd like to open our, our one and only public hearing for the night, item four, amendments to the parking and bicycle parking regulations. We have the staff report. Good evening. Um, nice to see you all in person. My name is Sarah Noisy. <laughs> I um, am a senior planner in the long range, or advanced planning division. The advanced planning division. And um, I am joined this evening by Joanna Edmonds from our public works department. Yeah, okay. Um, and we are going to be walking you through the proposed ordinance amendments. We have a little bit of background, then we'll go through the amendments, and then we'll have our recommendation at the end. Good evening. Um, so for the existing bike um, parking code, what we do for commercial developments is it's a percentage of the auto parking requirement. And since we now have AB 2097, which exempts new developments within half a mile of a major transit stop from auto parking requirements, that would mean then in turn, the commercial developments that fall into those areas would no longer require parking for bikes. And um, we still want to re require bike parking, especially if there's no auto parking in those areas. And then, so this is the map of the areas that would be affected by AB 2097. So you can see it's quite a big part of the city of Santa Cruz. And um, of note is the purple line on there. That's the coastal zone. Um, so a lot of the areas also fall into that zone there. 
And um, these are all, so a major transit stop is defined as where they have transit service every 15 minutes. So that doesn't necessarily have to be one route that's every 15 minutes, but if there are routes that overlap and there's a bus stopping there every 15 minutes, then that would be considered that. And then this, the red and the yellow areas are showing current and future with it, um, the zone that's within half a mile of those stops. So our proposals are for, um, this affects commercial bike parking because the residential we do per unit. Um, the commercial, we now are trying to switch that to square footage as opposed to as a percentage of auto parking so that we can continue to require bike parking for all of the developments. And then we're updating the land use categories to make it a little bit clearer what the requirements are, and also strengthening our objective standards and updating the code to our current practices. We're also making a slight change to the code to make it really clear what the requirements are within the parking district one, so that's the downtown <laughs> parking district. And then adding some requirements for space sized for cargo bikes, which is something that we continually hear, especially with the larger e-bikes that people are using now, that that's a concern for cyclists not having adequate space to park those. And then adding requirements for fixed stations and larger developments. Um, so that would be, if you're not familiar with that, there's like tools so you can fix your bike or um, there's a pump so you can pump up the air in the tires. And then we're also adding clarity clarity to the substitution of car parking for bike parking and um, on the location and design of facilities. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, how we're bringing our ordinance into compliance with AB 2097. So um, the state law, which is in effect, it was been in effect since January 1, um, removes parking requirements for most development within half mile of major transit stops throughout California. So um, there is a carve out allowance for requiring parking for hotels, motels, um, bed and breakfast, all, essentially all lodging uses. And so um, there are, the state law also includes a, some allowances about uh, requiring parking. And at this time, staff is not recommending that we pursue any of those allowances. Um, we can get into why that is. Um, but essentially, they are, uh, they, there's not a lot of clarity about how we would be making findings that, are, that would be required, and they seem to kind of conflict or be too ambiguous relative to other state law um, standards that we're also having to meet. So um, our recommendation is simply that we go with no required parking other than for lodging uses. Um, we're also doing this because our climate action plan, which was recently adopted, also includes actions focused on limiting off-street parking. In fact, that's going to be kind of one of the next work plan items to come out in the next year is doing some more work on parking citywide um, as a result of the actions that are called for in the climate action plan, the CAP. Um, we also know that like fully eliminating parking standards is, at this point in time, um, a practice that's been tested in many cities around the country and throughout California. So um, you know, Buffalo, New York was one of the first ones in like, the mid-2010s. Um, Santa Monica has also done it in their downtown. San Francisco has a citywide um, zero parking. Berkeley has a... Um, citywide zero parking um, standard. And then San Jose recently adopted one as well. So some of these um, policies carve out certain properties or certain areas or certain specific things that they might still require some type of parking for. Others are really just universal, like no parking. There's no parking required. That's um, you know, San Francisco's policy and Buffalo, New York's policy. Um, so you know, there are different kind of ways that folks are trying to um, balance these competing um, needs for flexibility for development, space for development, and um, you know, the cost of developing parking and trying to like, you know, find the right balance um, with also you know, mobility needs for the community. So um, any parking that does get built will have to meet um, state and federal regulations for providing accessible, handicapped accessible parking and then also state requirements for providing electric vehicle parking. So whenever a parking facility is created, it will be required to meet those standards. Um, we, also, um, we also know that there are other ways to meet some of our accessible parking needs. So on-street parking space can be reserved for accessible parking spaces um, at request. So folks can request blue curb. 
and um, those of us are reviewed through the Department of Public Works, and um, we are not, we have, <laughs> yeah, we, we tried to remember, we've never denied one, a request for blue curb. So, um, so there's that. There's also um, the fact that the, the handicap placard also entitles that vehicle to free parking at any metered space. So um, there are other tools in place that are ensuring that folks with mobility needs still have access and are able to um, get to places they need to, you know, participating in daily life and civic life. Um, the ordinance also includes some other clarifications around um, regulations for parking lifts. So the last time we updated this ordinance, we like added some language about parking lifts, but it was um, a little bit ambiguous. It's so it, we had inadvertently kind of not allowed them downtown. So then that's kind of where they're being proposed is downtown. So we were always having to like do this like separate process to like do a variation. So we're trying to kind of clean that up and, and make it clear that these are allowed in any zone district with um, you know certain standards around them. Um, they need to be enclosed. So we're at this point not allowing them in any place that would be open to the sky or visible. Um, and if they are going to be in places that might be open to the sky, then they can go through an administrative process so we can kind of look at those plans and ensure that they're um, you know, not creating um, noise impacts or visual, um, you know, unsightly parking structures in our neighborhoods. Um, we're also adding definitions of major transit stop and a parking lift as a result of making these various cleanups. So after this hearing tonight, um, the, our next step is to take this item to the city council with whatever the recommendation is from your commission. Um, should it be approved by the city council in some fashion on that date, then the second reading would be on um, the 25th of April, and then this would take effect um, 30 days after that, so at the end of May. And so this is just, I want to point out that that's almost, we're almost halfway through the year. And so one of the reasons that we are bringing this now and feeling a little bit of urgency to get it over the finish line is that we're getting development applications. And currently, you know, for these commercial spaces, we don't have a way to require bike parking in them under this um, current state law. So we are feeling like we want to do what we can do to get it in place. Um, so after, it's a, after the um, second reading of the ordinance, it would go to Coastal Commission. And so we'll, we'll get it to them sometime this summer, hopefully. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, we will have some further work later in the year and leading in, and and into next year, um, working on the implementations from the Climate Action Plan all, that also focus on parking and, um, and really focus on reducing parking requirements and um, everything that goes along with them. So um, with that, our recommendation is that your commission um, pass a motion to recommend to the city council approval of the amendments to the municipal code chapters presented in your packet that update parking uh, bicycle parking requirements, incorporate recent changes to state law relating to auto parking, update other existing standards, and add new definitions, including recommending that the council approve the associated updates um, to the LCP IP, which is our local coastal program implementation plan, which is essentially our zoning ordinance as it gets applied in the, zo um, in the coastal zone. With that, we're prepared to answer any questions you might have. All right, uh, thank you for the presentation. Questions? Uh, Commissioner Conway. Thank you, and thank you for um, that report. Um, so one of the things that I, I would like to, I have a couple of concerns, and they may not all relate um, exactly to this ordinance, um, but I would like to understand better what it is that we still have the possibility of requiring in terms of um, EV and disabled parking construction. You're keeping in mind that any project may include parking if they choose to. Um, but I, I just would like to understand better that piece. Sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. So um, the place where the state law um, sort of lays out what the allowances are um, starts on page four. 4.45 of your packet, mm -hmm. page 18 of that attachment of the text of AB 2097. Yeah. Um, so, let's see here. Sorry, let's 
starts on the, the page before that. So, um, 4.3. Yeah, 4.44. Sorry about that. Um, so, subsection B here says, um, notwithstanding subdivision A, which so subdivision A says there's no parking within half a mile of a major transit stop. Um, so, notwithstanding that, you can require a city or county may impose or enforce minimum auto parking on a project in those places if they make written findings within 30 days of the receipt of a completed application that by not imposing or enforcing a parking standard, um, the development would have a substantially negative impact on any of the following. And then it lists these three items um, that seem like they make good sense and then when you actually try to think about like what would that mean that like not requiring parking would have a negative impact on the city's ability to meet the arena and the housing allocation like how would you make that finding what are the things that you would look for to determine that you're not going to be able to meet the arena because you're not requiring parking um, not being able to meet any special needs special housing needs for the elderly or persons with disabilities um, it's sort of like the same thing like what are how are we defining those needs and how do they relate specifically to parking and how do they relate to the parking that happens on another development um, and that, like how would you make that finding and how would you do it within 30 days <laughs> and then the final one is um, sort of like the biggest and most nebulous one um, that there would be a negative impact on existing residential or commercial parking within one half mile of the housing development project so is that only off-street parking is that also on street parking what's a parking impact you know parking isn't a sequa issue so there aren't really like thresholds that are set for um, you know determining when is there a parking what is a parking impact and what does it mean for a place to be parking impacted um, so given that none of those things are defined here in the state law or in really any part of state law um, we think that's kind of a, a ball of worms that like leaves us open to um, kind of some liability about like unfair treatment like if we make this determination and make this finding that there's going to be a negative impact and then the developer comes disagrees like what is the evidence we're going to take to a lawsuit like we, we really just don't understand how to interpret this there's no case law about it and there's no definitions in the state law so that's that piece that theoretically we could require those and then there's another place where it talks about um, continuing to be able to require EV and, and accessible parking. Um, let me just find that spot. So that's on page 4.45, um, <coughs> subsection F. The section shall not reduce, eliminate, or preclude the enforcement of any requirement imposed on new multifamily residential or non-residential development that's located within one half mile of public transit, blah, 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 to provide electric vehicle supply equipment, installed parking spaces or parking spaces that are accessible to persons with disabilities that would have been, that would have otherwise applied to the development if this section did not apply. So that would essentially allow a jurisdiction to use their existing parking code to determine a parking requirement and then determine like of that parking requirement how much would be ADA, or I'm sorry, not ADA, California accessible, we need the California code. And then um, Cal Green, or in, in our case in Santa Cruz, we have our own local ordinance about EV required parking. So then we would make that determination and require those, we could require those parking spaces um, on site. I completely agree that this is a, it sounds like just a Gordian knot of language. Um, but I, um, what I, I guess the piece that I that I'd like to understand. I just think about how is this actually going to work, and um, and I think that it's probably true that the ordinance maybe should preclude all of it, maybe you know um, any requirements at all, and let development by development decide what they're going to do. Um, but I am concerned about a couple of things, and one of them is. Um, access to any of the densely built areas that are being proposed um, for people who are either um, disabled and in a private car and I don't think it's directly um, pertinent here but I'm just concerned because I spent a 
next couple years using the um, paratransit a lot. And um, paratransit is just incredibly important as a way of both um, people having independence or even if, de if they're not independent, having access to the community. Um, so I'm, I am, and I, I've been concerned about these as <coughs> we've looked at different projects anyway, just how, where are these little buses pulling up? Where are even delivery? It's come up in a lot of different ways. And again, it isn't all germane to this discussion. Um, but if we're not, okay, here we are. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm concerned about those transportation issues and despite the um, really Gordian knot of um, language of what we can work with in terms of w would we possibly want to still have the ability to require EV parking, disabled parking all the time, sometimes? Would we want to, re it, just because it's one of the last little shreds of local control that we have, and I kind of want to cling to it before we let go of it. <laughs> um, I, Claire Glogley, Transportation Planner, and I can jump in on the uh, paratransit element there. I think one of the important elements of paratransit is the ability to have proximate loading to where you are going to, mm -hmm. coming from, um, any of your origins and destinations. That relates to our on-street parking, which is in Chapter 10. What I'm hearing is a big interest in examining our loading requirements in Chapter 10 of our Muni Code. That is something that I can take back and look at. That would be reviewed by our Transportation and Public Works Commission. One of the things that we have in our work plan right now is to do a deeper dive on our curb management holistically. What does that look like for parking, parking management, loading, capacity that we want to see there, parking turnover, bike lanes, all of these things that relate to, as we're having uh, less and less parking in private development, how do you best utilize the public space and the public supply? So heard, understood, mm -hmm. agreed, and we can definitely take a look at um, how we relate loading zones to development, especially in these areas that are that fall under AB 2097. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just wanted to um, agree with Commissioner Conway as far as, uh, I guess the question I have for you is why, I understand the language challenge, um, just the, those three things that are listed, um, two seems probably the clearest to me, which is around an impact to an elderly, <clears throat> excuse me, or disabled person because um, that kind of access is defined in code. And um, I, I, I know people who use vans that have a really hard time using street parking for vans. They really need, because they have a, a ramp that comes out of those vans. And so um, that's certainly a concern. With these huge changes that the law has brought and this being new, why wouldn't we keep that flexibility and come back in a year or two, and if we don't need it, we don't need it, why would we give it away up front? Sure, yeah, happy to speak to that, so thanks for that question. I, um, so, I think it's a matter of like, of interpreting these words and recalling that the, the these apply, these, this law applies to all developments, not just for housing, and it's, um, uh, so what, what, what I'm struggling with is um, what would it mean for, like, um, you know, a, a new retail business to open and to not provide any parking on their site? Um, and how is that affecting our ability to meet special housing needs for the elderly? So, you know, what is the, what is the ret what is the commercial component of parking have to do with the housing <coughs> needs of the elderly, and not, and like by not requiring parking there, that's negatively impacting our ability to meet those housing needs. Like, what would be the criteria that we would use? That's that's kind of what we struggled with and, and kind of couldn't answer for ourselves. So, I, I mean, if you have some thoughts on that, I, we're open to hearing them. Well, I, I j just to be clear for clarification, if we kept this ability 
these for these accommodations, the default would be no no parking requirement. Is that correct? Well, it depends how we write write it in the code. But we could write it in a way where the default would be no, no parking. parking requirement unless we can make yes. these findings and support them. Is that correct? We could write it that way. Yeah. I mean, I think you could write the local code in a, in a couple of different ways, mm -hmm. right? Where you start with like the default is they're required unless you disprove this finding or yep. you know what I mean? Or, or, the, or the other, other way, way around. They're right. not required unless we make a finding right. that, we, that could. We, we feel could. we could strongly support, right? And that, that in some ways addresses the concern, right? Because you would only be moving forward with a requirement if you as planning staff really felt like you could put together something that would stand up in court, right? I mean, I theoretically, sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess my concern, so this would be my concern, Commissioner Dawson, is that um, by having that like caveat available in the code, that then um, there would just be a, a ton of pressure to always be able to make that finding. And I just honest, like if I'm being really honest, I don't know how we will make that finding and I don't want the public to think we can make it because I'm not sure that we can. I don't know what it would look like to make that point. I think um, that section you pointed out, number two, um, to me makes no sense at all because there's already a carve out for accessible parking. So if the city wants to require it, they can require it. So what, what type of circumstance would necessitate us for even, even having to make that finding? is the question we have. I mean, it makes no sense to us. Um, and then the first one, you know, it's, it speaks to the city's ability to meet RENA for low and very low income households. I mean, by eliminating parking, you're providing more area for units for to be built. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? Um, I mean, we, we struggled mm -hmm. like you did at the mm -hmm. staff level on the whole EV. Right. and and um, accessible parking. And I think we're, the reason we arrived at this point was probably threefold. Um, one, you look at all the cities who have eliminated parking already, and they're still building parking. Right. So they're getting accessible spaces, and they're getting EV spaces. Um, we have the CAP plan that seek, the CAP policy that seeks to eliminate parking, so it's sort of pointed that way. We've got Public Works, who has a program that allows accessible spaces to be um, provided on the street. And I know we're doing EV spaces in our parking garages, so, so it's happening. Mm -hmm. And then functionally, I mean, you take a development in the downtown, um, let's say a mixed-use development, uh, it just seems like it would not be an efficient use of land to provide access into a first-floor space behind maybe a commercial that only has three or four accessible spaces and a couple of EV spaces. It just it just right. doesn't right. seem very functional, um, mm -hmm. especially for folks thinking that they can park in there and then finding out they can't. So that's why we arrived at, at, at the recommendation that we did. Just yeah. to follow real quick, I'm remembering the corridor plan mm -hmm. process where we went through like almost lot by lot, looking at what requiring that parking like did to all those. Right. Right. You know, relatively narrow, C and it, would, it, it just destroyed, I mean, there's no way to develop that land, so. Right. I was thinking of how great it would be to not require parking for those. Um, not to get into discussion, more questions? Yeah. Uh, Com Commissioner Gordon? Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't what I was waiting for. Oh. <laughs> um, Good. <laughs> um... <laughs> I want to support this because for all the things that you're saying and from a development, you know, just a logical standpoint, having a bunch of useless space for used for circulation in these developments is not efficient. But I can't help, I again sound a little bit like a broken record, is that I kind of want to know the bigger picture. Like I want to say yes to this, but I want to know as we're looking at the downtown expansion and um, all these major changes that we're making and um, that that we are 
going to be able to meet the needs of our demographic. I saw the list of all the cities that are doing that. I look at that and I'm like, okay. Oh, sorry. That was my time up? Okay. Oh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I, I, I see the demographic. I mean, I, I see the list and I think through our demographic versus some of those cities and I wonder, you know, how does that relate to us? And um, so I'm curious, are there, wh or what, what are the elements that we can look at and say, okay, if we say yes to this and we give up the, the last bits of, you know, like things we can grasp that we actually have control over for the city, where is that going to lead us a decade from now when the expansion is fully you know, expanded, <laughs> and the demographic is X, and we have Y, so. Right, so I have a couple, I have a couple thoughts on that. So, um, so first of all, um, I just wanna remind us that most development that happens, that has happened in these places that have eliminated minimums, hasn't been developed with zero parking. There are, there are a few, right, and there are a few ways that projects that are built now are eligible for zero parking. Um, and I actually want to, I'm sorry, I meant to do this during the staff presentation, I forgot. I wanted to correct a statement I made in the staff report about 831 Water. Um, I said they were providing 80 parking spaces for 140 units, and they're not. They're actually providing 139 spaces for 140 units of housing um, by using parking stackers. I was, look, I was counting the spaces on the plans, and there are 80 spaces on the plans, but they're using a stacker to get to that higher number. So. I apologize for that. They are actually getting to about one space per unit. Um, and just to say, they didn't have to provide any. They could have provide, yeah, provided yeah, zero parking. Yeah. And the same at Jesse Street, they could have provided zero parking. Mm -hmm. And they're providing, you know, not a ton, but like, I don't know, a dozen, 10, a dozen spaces, something like that. Um, the, the one place where we are seeing development go in with zero parking is um, Pack South, right? So that it's like on top of the metro station, like right directly next door. Um, and then targeted towards supportive housing, right? So this is serving a population that is much less likely to be thriving. And so I do think that, you know, probably most places in Santa Cruz are gonna continue to provide some amount of parking, and this is just gonna allow those, you know, developers to really look at the market and look at their demographic that they're, they're seeking to serve, and then decide how much parking is the right amount of parking. And then the first space they build is an ADA space. Right. <laughs> and then the second space, they and it, I think it's actually an EV charging ADA Both. space, <laughs> is that first, that first parking space. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, so I, I do think that a lot of those things are going to be met. You know, the, thinking about the um, Warriors Arena, should they like should that actually come to fruition? Building a permanent Warriors Arena, um, I don't think there's any way that they would run a successful business without having a pretty significant amount of parking there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I do think there are like reasons to believe that adequate parking will be built. And the other thing that I always um, kind of remember with these is that um, habits around driving aren't habits that change because we just we decide we want to change them. They're, they change because it gets inconvenient, expensive, and like hard to do. Mm -hmm. And so if we're really committed to reducing driving as a primary mode of transportation around Santa Cruz, we're going to go through these tight changes, you know. Um, and so, the thing that kind of helped me relax about the, the, the um, accessible parking, in particular, was a couple of things. I mean, first of all, it's the curb management thing that Claire already mentioned. Like there is um, some work to be done around that, and at the same time, we allow by request to create on street marked. Um, Right. And so, yes, there's some work to do to make sure that those are van accessible when that's what's needed and that there are some portion within the public realm and the public right of way that are already van accessible without meeting that request. And so, yes, there's some work to do there and it's, um, it's kind of like in that <coughs> management piece. Um, and all of us, the rest of us able-bodied folks are going to get a little more uncomfortable and we're going to bike more and we're going to take the bus and it's going to be less convenient. Yeah, I just wanted to expand on um, what Sarah had mentioned already. So I think there's two sides of it. There's the private side, and then there's the public side. So as Sarah mentioned, many of the private side developments are still providing parking. I like to think that we're in the messy middle right now as we're transitioning away from 
how we've done things to how we will do things and starting to achieve and realize a lot of our policy statements and our policy ideals. So on the public side, we're seeing the provision of parking, maybe not to the same level that our code would require, if if our code still could require parking, but still a level of parking that, um, that there is still some there it does require EV and ADA parking spaces as well. On the public side, this is one of my favorite things to talk about, even though most of my work is in active transportation, but parking management is a huge driver of behavior change. Private parking is the least efficient use of parking. When we have public supply, when we have shared supply, we are able to utilize fewer parking spaces for higher and better uses. In the downtown, our parking spaces get used three to four times a day. Uh, you guys may have heard me say this before as we talked about the library before, but call it pancakes, pottery, pints, and pillows. So four different uses, people coming for four different times of the day using, using those spaces. So as we do grow, specifically thinking about the downtown plan expansion, is there a public role there to provide a shared parking facility that's then used much more efficiently than each of these buildings individually providing parking? Is there a way to make sure that we do have loading zones and ADA accessible spaces in closer proximity to some of these developments that we're seeing? I think that's something I feel very, very comfortable realizing. And it is going to be a change from how we've done things of this is my parking space in my building to this is the parking facility that I have a permit to park in. And every day I'll probably park somewhere different. That's part one. Part two is as we transition away from uh, every individual trip being, or most individual trips being in a personal personal automobile, we have the ability to expand the type of program that Joanna and I run for downtown Go Santa Cruz, which provides free transit passes, um, carpool cash, bike locker cards, education encouragement, free helmets, free lights, just a plethora of incentives to help people change behavior. One of the things that we have been looking at is how do we expand that to broader areas of the city and what is a uh, what is the mechanism to do so? And I think as we do see increasing density and increasing development, hand in hand with that, we will be looking to expand our non-auto programs as well. So really it is the messy middle as we're going through this transition, but I have a lot of hope and a lot of confidence that we have a lot of good tools to get through this messy middle. Yeah. Thank you. I and when I was talking about a plan and wanting to say as I was actually separating the two between, I actually don't think that this it should be a burden on developers that are doing this density, but I, when I said the plan, I wanted to know, like, as a city, what is our plan? Because as we've seen here, there have been some of the largest projects that we've seen yet, and I, we got the answer, yeah, we're going to look closer at that loading zone or that drop-off zone. So as we're making big moves here to say, yeah, we're on board, but some of these other things aren't quite up to speed with the projects that we're seeing, I get concerned about, like, what's our what's our plan as a city? <laughs> you know, like, when we're saying yes to all these, which we want to do because we want housing, where is that going to leave us and, and how quickly can we mobilize as a as a city entity to meet the needs of the community as as the community sees these big projects come before us so thank you all right uh, commissioner maxwell yeah I get, um thanks again um uh, my question i have a couple of i know i think i read something in the staff report around commercial space and like or like mixed use projects and uh, you know, when we have a rush, like we went through the what, the other, not 831, but the 9-something oh, Water Street project where it's not necessarily going to be a restaurant, but it could be. And with, a, you know, a large size restaurant and there, we're not really requiring any parking for like a short term use in an area where there probably isn't. And we're going to see overflow into the neighborhood behind it. And how how is that going to work with this kind of, with this? with just no requirement on these in like a use like that? Um, I mean, I think that's kind of the same answer I gave Commissioner Gordon, is that it's going to be inconvenient, uncomfortable, and expensive, right? So um, overflow parking, like parking on the public street, you know, that, that parking is available to everyone, right? Like right. public curb space. 
Um, and so without, you know, having a permit, a parking permit um, program in place, then, um, you know, there, there would be, you know, overflow parking and people would be using that curb space. So, you know, I think that's, you know, that's just kind of, kind of in that middle ground where yeah. we are right now. You know, I think that's just, that's true. That's just a reality. Yeah, yeah I mean, I get it. Just really unfortunate if you live, I mean, it's really not going to happen downtown, but along the corridors, you know, that's where we're really going to see the impact into those neighborhoods back there. Um, the other thing, too, is with around regarding the language that we are having such a hard time quantifying. Uh, since there have been other cities, and especially in the Bay Area, that have tackled state law language, is there any other, do we have examples from anything that has happened uh, you know, that has precedence as far as like Berkeley or Oakland around tackling that language of those three, those three items. Pieces. I am not familiar with any, I haven't found any other examples of, of implementing this state law. So the, the regulation that Berkeley has precedes this and it, it's, and it exceeds the requirements. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I haven't, I didn't find anybody else's <laughs> codified language yet. Right. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, yeah, it seems like it. Uh, the last thing is, um, I was reading, like, the the bill goes on, is reading it verbatim, the bill goes on to then limit these findings, ensuring that they do not apply to housing with a minimum of 20% of the units to dedicated as affordable housing or to projects with 20 housing units or fewer, or in a case where other provisions of state law, such as density bonus law and others, allow for parking reductions. Can you explain that a little bit better? That seems like there's a lot of commas in like in this and then this and then so that. So there's like, yeah, so there's like this that down. standard that they sit, set of like, no parking's required. And then there's an exception to that standard that's like, oh, but you can require parking in these three circumstances. And then there's an exception to the exception that's like, actually, no, you still can't require parking if any of these other pieces are true. And so um, <coughs> one of those is like, the development contains fewer than 20 housing units. Got it. I understand that Clear. one. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> um, the first one, the development dedicates a minimum of 20% of the total number of housing units to very low, low, or moderate income households, students, the elderly, or persons with disabilities. So um, that sounds very clear, but like, how do we interpret that 20% um, in a density bonus project? Correct. Right. We're and how do we, um, what does it mean for a housing unit to be dedicated to students. Like, we don't have a way to record that. And how do you check, and what's a student? Like, you know, how do you define these terms? So, you know, there are definitions for elderly and persons with disabilities, right? Like, that's right. pretty clear. Um, so, anyway, you know, I, basing our um, interpretation on the way that we have read other state law and the way other state law has been interpreted by the courts, we would read that 20% as to be 20% of the base of a density bonus project, in which case that's every development that we have, you know, unless it exceeds 20%. So they would already be accepted from the exceptions that we wouldn't be able to require parking then either. Um, and then number three, the development is subject to parking reductions based on the provisions of any other applicable law. So that's basically saying like if there's any other reasons that they don't have to provide parking, then you don't have to use this reason to tell them they don't have to provide parking. They can use that other reason. And that would essentially be the ones that I'm familiar with are basically density bonus pieces um, that you can get a waiver of parking requirements right. and in some case some cases require mm -hmm. zero parking so yes just other other ways that the state law incorporates like all of these complications and we're like let's just not require any parking <laughs> right okay so and then we don't have to get into parsing all of these bits you know sort of makes sense but yeah Got it. You get enough of those exceptions. Yeah, it's it like all the way around. around. <laughs> Thanks for that answer, though. I know that was a, I was like a, a I was doing circles. Yeah, yeah. That. I was like, wait, what's the exception to the exception? We've been circling okay. that law for three months now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With you. Okay. Well, thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Um, I just wanted to clarify some of this language, and one thing I've learned about ambigu ambiguous legal language is it's unforgiving. And so I want to clarify and get your understanding on this. So a preponderance of the evidence would be more likely than not, like 51% is enough to That's, satisfy that. That would be my understanding. 
Okay. It's a, I mean, a preponderance of the evidence is like, a, it's actually a pretty higher, it's a higher legal standard than I think there's substantial evidence is the other standard that they use sometimes. And preponderance is more yeah, than substantial. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> okay, so then in theory, to make a finding of a negative impact, whatever, substantially negative impact, whatever that means, the city would have the burden of proof and they would have to walk into court and by a preponderance of the evidence prove that it's a negative impact. We would have to be able to do that, yes. We might not actually have to walk into court. We would have right. to be, like have the findings, and if we got sued, we'd want to be like, that's going to stand up. Right. You'd want to be ready to go. Okay. And all of that with essentially your hands tied behind your back with exceptions to exceptions to exceptions. Right. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? Go ahead. I'm curious. Um, like I'm assuming that parking deficiency fees and things like that will not be in existence any longer. If uh, <laughs> Can I ask Claire? Don't you uh, my talk about that. that Hello, this is language that is going to the downtown commission next week on okay. Thursday morning, the 23rd, whichever day that is. Um, yes, we are sunsetting. We're proposing sunsetting the parking deficiency fee. We had that in our plan for downtown COVID hit. We hit pause, and now we're just proposing to get rid of it rather than resume. In lieu fees, we allow in the downtown right now, and then we also allow outside the downtown on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, they will only be allowed for projects in that are in the AB 2097 areas for lodging and the other very, very minor kind of event centers. Lodging and event centers. Just, well, I mean, our ordinance isn't making a carve-out for it. Okay. Just lodging. Just lodging. Um, yes, you could use in lieu fees then for just lodging. Um, within the downtown, that's set at $20,000 per space. Elsewhere, <laughs> we, we require a little bit more economic analysis. It's not a set rate. So um, very, in very, very limited cases, would we see the in lieu fee? Uh, before you go, mind if I squeak in one question? Oh, no, uh, this is the bike stuff. I'm hearing tons of interest in the parking stuff and the curb stuff. In your natural course of business, when is that being revised also? I, I, I just recognize these things take forever to get through the process. So. Oh, in the bike stuff related to the... Um, like the curb thing you mentioned. Oh, curb management, other yes. kind of parking broader issues. Yeah, broader you issues. So get revised every three years or when you have time for it? No, it's in our work plan for the next year plus. We have a new parking okay. programs manager on board. So as we're getting, right now we're dealing with downtown and a lot of things related to uh, state law changes. Mm -hmm. As soon as we get our arms around that, then it's looking citywide. Likely we'll start on arterials and collectors and then as needed expand from there. Okay, because that's the next step in this transformation. All right, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, and I actually had some questions about bike parking as well, but um, I'm gonna let Joanna I'm not take those unless yet. she needs me. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so thanks for your patience with this. I know you guys have been, you know, um, circling around it, and so we're basically saying that we're gonna have a market-driven um, parking creation program. Um, so, and I'm not worried about the commercial spaces because it's really clearly in their economic best interest to provide the parking that they think they need. And hopefully they're wrong because everyone, we're getting so used to doing something other than driving that maybe they overbuild it. Maybe this is a segue into one of my questions. Um, so, but I guess I, I do still wonder if, um, you know, there's, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I am in favor of building less parking. Um, absolutely, that's been the bane of much of my professional life. Um, but even still, what I wonder <coughs> about is, um, are we having, um, outside of whatever the warriors are gonna do, and actually I might have some more questions about that, there's gonna be, we're presuming there's gonna be some parking built um, south of Laurel. Um, that's going to serve the, the um, stadium or arena? I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty safe assumption. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much. I, we, 
the only standard under the state law that we would be allowed to set would be right. related to employee and worker parking. Mm -hmm. That's another narrow carve out. Sorry that I forgot to mention. Okay. It's for event centers, also not defined in the law. Um, but they were pretty into it, like at the public right. open house. And yeah, I mean, I think the so. Magic. The city isn't right. defining yeah. it. Is they're going to they're going to do what they want to do. Is that my question? Is um, so, I mean, I'm sure they're going to have some good studies and figure out what they need, and they're going to build a bunch of parking so that they can have a successful arena. Um, is that parking then limited only to that use? Is the city going to have a relationship with it? Is there um, any kind of a, um, you know, I, I love how Claire put it, the three Ps, you know, the different reasons a space gets used. Is that is that going to be some part of of our future, I, I'm not actually that comfortable with the with relying on painting a curb blue, um, for a bunch of reasons. I mean, I, I know we can do it, and I see them all over the place, but I worry about how do how do we know? So, um, so I'll answer the first part of this. Is um, I think the the use of those spaces is still um, being determined, right? Like the mm -hmm. downtown plan expansion isn't finished. We've had kind of this delay through the winter here as we're um, figuring out the details that are going to go into the CEQA work. Um, and the discussion of how the parking resources that do get built in that area, how they will be used and shared with the parking district is an ongoing one. Um, we're also discussing, you know, are we going to annex this whole area into the parking district or are they going to create their own district mm -hmm. um, for us south of Laurel? Okay. And, and that is not, you know, I, I think we're leaning in a direction, but we haven't resolved that yet. Okay. Um, and I also think that like that, you know, the use of that parking facility that we are assuming will be built with the arena, um, I think that that's something that could be part of the negotiations that the city has with the warriors around like, um, without putting public funding in, right. <laughs> how are we supporting, you know, creating kind of a mutually beneficial relationship and all of that work is still um, a few months out. Okay. Uh, but yes, that's definitely like on the table. It does make sense that we're not going to have totally pinched parking every everywhere downtown except for the ginormous empty <laughs> parking ramp that's down by the stadium. Right, and it's only open for Warriors games. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I'm expecting that's not. Adding to that on a couple levels, I, I think it would, I would hope it would be readily apparent to the Warriors that that doesn't make economic sense, especially with housing development occurring in the South Laurel area and game days being not all too frequent. Um, other options that exist that the city has done before is to partner with private businesses. In the past, we partnered with NIAC and allowed for public use of their owned parking lot after 5 p.m. So they had use for their employees during the day and then it was publicly available in the evening. The city did all of the maintenance and enforcement on those lots. So there are both opportunities for private-private agreements to share parking as well as public-private agreements to utilize either private parking or public parking. So we've done those before. We're, we're comfortable with them. And as we do expand and densify, we'd look for those areas that we could do that um, in new and emerging areas that don't have existing shared parking supply. You guys have just gotten to go through the joy of a uh, recommending the library affordable housing project that included a parking component that I've been working on since 2016. <laughs> so uh, I, I do think that publicly available shared parking is a really important component of utilizing our limited land area to its highest and best use. I do think that the city should play a role in that. We have the ability and um, capacity to do so. So I think as we do look to these areas, there will be some hard choices on, on land use and saying we're going to dedicate some space to a parking facility, which is a hot button issue, but allows for the increased intensification for other uses. Mm -hmm. I would hardly agree with that, and I'm glad that you're having those conversations. That's it for me on parking. Then I All right, uh, another question, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, thanks for um, talking about the Warrior Stadium, and it, it just brought up for me that does. Couldn't that hypothetically put us in a situation like to want to retain this ability? Because 
Julie hit the nail on the Commissioner Conway hit the nail on the head, right? This is a market driven parking system we're sort of setting up. Um, and the warriors are going to run a business. They're going to want to build a certain amount of parking associated with that business. If that number c comes out to be very, very large, I mean, couldn't it affect our ability to meet our arena numbers for low and very low if they're going to take over if they large swaths to build parking? You mean if they build too much parking? Yeah. Well, obviously it's not too much to them, but maybe from our perspective it would be too much because we would maybe want to build low-income housing in that area. So um, so what you're talking about there is um, sort of a parking maximum, right? About limiting the amount of parking that they can build. And what this law is about is about parking minimums. So um, parking maximums is something that the cap directs us to take a look at, like after we've implemented a few other pieces about mm -hmm. eliminating parking requirements mm -hmm. to then come back and look at maximum right. parking. And um, that's not what this law allows us to do. Okay. And okay. let me just add to, um, don't, lose, don't lose track of that concern because we can regulate that through the downtown plan potentially <coughs> okay. if we feel there's a need to do so. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so I just had one more, well, two more questions. The downtown library is good because I'm getting my brain around uh, parking districts and how awesome and flexible those are. And it's like, it's a really big adjustment, even though I feel like I'm kind of, you know, on the bleeding edge there. Is there the potential long term to develop parking districts along the corridors? Or I mean, it's kind of silly because that's where generally we're getting rid of parking, but Yes. Would that we have flexibility? I know the um, Ocean Street plan kind of has this in it, if I yes. remember right. Yes. Uh, Parking District Law of 1950 something uh, allows for a process to create parking districts in almost any location. You have to, there's a whole process to go through. You need the property owners to, to endorse it, buy in. And then um, it creates, the, the most powerful tool that it creates is the ability to bond. And that is, as you see in the downtown, that's how we fund our parking facilities, is that we bond, and then we share the overall expense of bond repayment over the universe of spaces, not just a specific project. That's why we can raise parking pricing by 25 to 75 cents and pay for an entire new facility. Um, in other areas of town, we do have the ability to do that hand in hand with creating a parking district. I would uh, encourage in every instance to also price parking in those areas as one of our most powerful parking management tools. And is that the same in the coastal zone or does it get weird? Um, it is the same in the coastal zone. It just involves a little more process. Okay. <laughs> That's as amazing. with all things in the coastal zone. So then the, like the second and last question, and like I lived in Berkeley, so I've experienced like nonstop parking tickets for not having the right. I was younger then, you know, I didn't take care of my business. <laughs> but the next extension is like the neighborhoods and it's politically unpopular to say this, but that would be the like, I don't know that council's ready to go there, but eventually this leads to permit parking, you mean? Permit parking everywhere or the whole city's yeah. a district at some level. So I'm right, not saying like it'll be $100 a month or anything, but that's the idea here, right? Our code does allow for the entire city right now to be permit parking, <coughs> residential permit parking. Right now it's written that you have to opt in. You need to get a petition of 50% plus one of the neighbors, move through the process. Some of the earlier tools I think that you could use on that right now in our existing residential parking zones, we allow for five permits per residence. They are priced at $35 per year. And uh, then you can also get up to 30 day passes for guests, et cetera. So using pricing or using number of available permits is probably an easier tool to start with. Uh, getting 51% of your neighbors to agree is, is the impediment there, but it's good to remind everybody that even though it's like kind of clunky in my opinion, that that process does exist. All right, so unless there's other questions, I think we'll bring it back for a motion and some more discussion. Yeah. Oh, we should open the public hearing just yeah. in case. <laughs> Would anyone from the public like to speak? No, we'd have to wait for the <laughs> Zoom delay anymore, so uh, seeing none, well, thanks, John. Uh, okay. yeah. mm -hmm. I wanted to actually talk about bike parking a little bit, too. 
That's fine. Is there, you're yeah. discussing it? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, just not quite ready to for a motion. I just had some kind of dumb questions. Yeah, about. no, that's fine. And I think the, the motion <coughs> would be starting that, too. Yeah. I wasn't trying to push it through. I've got a few more mm -hmm. thoughts, too. Okay. So, commissioners, uh, discussion or motion? You want to start? Uh, so, this is just a couple of very practical <laughs> things. I'm thinking about, um, you know, the little bike um, tool area, which I think, you know, such a great idea. Certainly would have been very happy. You know, there used to be a place you could pump up outside of the spokesman, and then they had to take it down, which brought up for me. Um, how How is this managed? Where are these places? So any place that there's, could you, I'd just like to know a little bit more about how they will really yeah. work and who's watching them. Um, so where we are talking about are in, usually would be in a bike room inside. So for mixed use developments mm -hmm. that have a lot of housing, I see. they um, sometimes will add, they'll meet their class one bike parking requirements um, by having a bike room that's only accessible to residents. So maybe they have a key card and then they can individually lock their bikes up there. So that's the kind of place where we would put a fix-it station. Um, and so it's just we part don't, of the property management. Yeah, if we put them out in the public right-of-way, mm -hmm. the, the tools are all going to get stolen. So that's not the kind of place we're, gonna, we're trying to add those into <laughs> private areas that are secure and only available to residents or employees of those um, developments. So if I did have a flat on my way to work, I'm pretty much out of luck, just like always. Well, I think there'll be something eventually at the metro station that's a little bit different because, um, but that would probably be something connected with Bike Link. So that, mm -hmm. that's who we use right now for the bike lockers. So that's one case that would be different if they, it, I think as part of that development as it you know, comes down the pipeline that they would consider putting in a Bike Link managed room um, and they might have something like that. But yeah, I think it would be mostly like we do have one here in our um, bike cage for city employees but that has a code again because the same thing it, the tools I know we had when I worked at UCSC we had a few I don't know if they still do but they're constantly having to replace the tools and it's just not um, a, a good use of those fix-it stations yeah. in the public area like that all right thanks for talking more about those soon there'll be a <clears throat> b-cycle station nearby so you can hop on an e-bike and get home. Huh? Yeah, that's true. That's good. Nope. Does it? Please, go ahead. <laughs> I have another question. It's kind of a dumb question. No dumb questions. <laughs> Come on. Saying. <laughs> so um, at some point, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I think I wrote down number six, that there's a trade-off. If, if we do overbuild parking, um, we can convert that to bike parking. So let's say that this, you know, this is, we're really successful. We've completely embraced it. We have built parking and we find out we have too many parking places for cars. Um, so then we're gonna take, I mean, we, there's, it's a huge financial investment to build a parking space. And um, so I, I was just curious about, about where this um, ability comes from, that you can convert it into, was it six, a certain number? That's, that, I think you're referring to a provision or a code that allows the conversion of required parking okay. to bike parking. Okay. Oh, that's right. You can like buy your way Yeah, so it's a right, six so for one I see. Okay. trade off. I see. And, I and miss, we've used it from time piece. to time in development. I found it on my second reading and I thought, wait, did I miss that? So thank But you. with as much of the city that's now exempt from parking, I think we're going to be seeing less and less of requests for those. Right. Mm -hmm. and just, so typically, this is something. Project review. Mm -hmm. <coughs> something we've seen come in later. Okay. Where, you know, they build it right. and they back to it. Nowadays, they would convert that space to ADU. So it right. not be That's a good point. <laughs> they certainly would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. Hi. One thought uh, or question about the bike parking and different sizes is. Um, as we're seeing a lot of these projects come in and there's, it's sort of a new um, priority for us as a city and developers um, working in this way. Um, how are we 
evaluating the functional aspects as these plans are coming in and are we prepared to address circulation and um, you know storage and getting in and out and interfacing with bodies and cars and all those things. So is your question about when we're reviewing the plans? Yeah, uh, I, I guess the question is like, are we prepared <laughs> as a city, you know, to to from a design perspective to evaluate the functionality mm -hmm. and, and that meets the alignment of the amount of storage, you know, because there's just a like we know how to do that with parking and cars going in and out and spacing, and I mean we've got decades of experience in that, and this is you know so something newer to us as a city, and so. Just curious. The requirements for bike parking aren't new. We're just adjusting. So we do, so every time there is a, a development or um, someone's changing the square footage of their, like they're remodeling and there's adding new square footage or they're changing the use, we do, it does trigger a review of are they meeting the bike parking part of the code as well as all the other things they have to meet. And so... You know, they have to meet the things that are laid out in the code, but we do look at this, like, is this something that's logical? If you are a, a person using a bike, are they building it, you know, on the fourth floor, away from an elevator? Like that, we wouldn't approve that because that doesn't make any sense. Um, so we don't want to get too nitty-gritty with all of the details in the code because we're trying to make it easy for people to include bike parking in a way that benefits the community. Um, but we are looking at it from a lens of what it would be like for a cyclist every time we're reviewing the plans. Does that help? Yeah. Can you I, understand? I, 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 and, I don't know. You know, it's just not even as an ar architecture firm, it's not mm. something that we have gone through extensively because we're just now seeing this level of development in our city, you know, <laughs> like to this degree with these requirements. And I know that in things that we've seen recently, again, we're talking about how to get deliveries into restaurants and there's plans that have come before us where they're like huh yeah we're thinking about that <laughs> so i'm wondering like you know how, how are we you know armed with yeah adding adding to what joanna said i would say specifically we do plan review on every single project that comes through and oftentimes more often than not i would say uh applicants get the bike parking very very wrong so stupid they're like behind the trash enclosure, places that you would think, right. A, they don't comply with our code in any way, but B, my favorite was a paved pad in the middle of landscaping with no path to it. That when I went out to do a, a site review, it was like, no, that's, that's obviously not going to work. Um, but during the plan review process, we do offer to do a lot of hand-holding. We offer to help select the style of rack. We offer to help select uh, elements of the bike room. We offer to meet prior to a plan is submitted in order to provide feedback, useful feedback, to talk through those design issues. Joanna does a really great job with that, making sure that she's available to um, help people better understand who don't have that experience as a cyclist or haven't designed projects with cyclists in mind before. So we um, are also working on kind of a handout sheet to go with that about here are some of the things that you should think about, stuff that's a lot more challenging to make into objective standards, but here's our recommendations. Here's kind of a cheat sheet for how you can best do it right on your first try, or maybe your second try. Perfect. And I'll add that, um, especially on the bigger projects, we always encourage applicants to go through the pre-application process so that um, you know before the plans get too fully baked, that um, we can work out some of these details, and and, we, and they do take advantage of that quite often. So we're trying to get to them as early as possible. Thank you. All right, and more discussion? I've got just uh, two more quick things to say. Much as I love EV parking, like I don't even get it in this context because it's not like overnight parking if you're using that spot for three or four. So, you know, you saw me on apartment projects pushing that in. I just like, much as I love it, I don't think it applies here because the point is to have those spots be like interchangeable and can be this one day and this another day or different times a day. 
So I, and I work in the energy code, so I'm really used to the government just like spitballing stuff into these laws, literally like the day before it goes to the legislature. So I didn't like follow this one, but it just has that feel of like, at the last minute, we're gonna like throw all these things in there. So I wanted to support staff in saying, let's not adopt that. I know the position that puts you in when the language is really awkward or unclear, even right or wrong, just if it's like terribly written. Um, I really wanted to say again that I support that. Last concern is we have a little loophole here where projects might go through without bike parking required. Is that a big concern? Can you write me a condition of a project <coughs> to slap it on those projects? Or, you know, how seriously should we worry about that, given there's, what, a year of process probably until this gets into law? Well, so, so this would take effect if, we, if, if it gets recommended mm -hmm. and the council um, this would take effect end of May. Okay. So we're not talking, this is it, the work has happened. So good. good. Um, I, I don't know, so, so for bike parking, they already have bike parking standards that covers residential development, mm -hmm. so that's like fine. Um, the concern is new commercial development. I can't. Do we ever? Unless have we it's ever? attached to yeah. multifamily. Oh, the Delaware edition, maybe. Yeah. Um, but most of that stuff's already entitled. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so no big deal. So, like. um, I mean, and yeah, I mean, I think a condition of approval might be a, a, an okay way to handle that if we do run into one in the next couple of months. I would love um, to see it if it does come up. Yeah, but I, I don't know. We're not like panicked about it yet, and also we don't want to wait too much longer because um, you know these things are going to start coming in. Mm -hmm. And we're going to negotiate with applicants you know in the early stages anyways and you know point out that you know hey this is going to be a good selling point for your project when it gets to the decision makers cool i'm with uh, commissioner conway the, the last little grasp grasp yeah. of local control we have i like to hold on to it um good well i'm ready to hear a motion in a second unless other people feel differently i would move the staff recommendation all right i'll second uh, moved by Commissioner Conway, seconded by Commissioner Paul Hamas. Any further discussion? Let's have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Paul Hamas? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Um, so the motion passes unanimously with all commissioners in favor. I'm supposed to say that per the bylaws, so I'm trying to train myself. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like you should state what happened, yeah. you know? People watching are like, what? What was the vote? So, um, good, with that, we'll close the public hearing. Do we have any informational items? I can give you a couple, mm -hmm. uh, couple items. Um, so last Tuesday, the library mixed use project was at city council and was approved on a 5-1-1 vote. Um, with a couple of uh, additional conditions added around additional tree planting. I think it came out to about four to one. Um, and then reuse of some of the magnolia trees that were going to be um, eliminated to within the parking, reusing that wood to be used within the project. Sorry. Um, rail trail, that project's been called up by uh, Council Member Bruner under provisions of the uh, zoning code that allows council members to bring projects up, that's going to be heard on Monday evening at 6 p.m. by the City Council. Um, and then... That's a, like a special meeting? It is a special meeting, yes. Yep. And upcoming uh, reminder, we have a special meeting on the 30th of uh, this month regarding the Coral Street visioning um, exercise that we're working on. Uh, we have nothing yet on the agenda for April 6th. Um, but April 20th, we have a couple of um, mainly informational items around uh, the CIP. Uh, we have a housing element general plan annual report um, and then a review of the draft housing element. So pretty full agenda on the 20th. Exciting business for Earth Day. Yep. <laughs> That's all I have. All right. Thanks, Eric. <coughs> Uh, we don't have any subcommittees and nor any items referred to future agendas. So I will now adjourn the meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.
Really, it's crazy.